So thank you all for joining us early. You've made it to the right spot if you're looking for the Climate Advocate Training. We're in a meeting setup, which is different from the webinar that we just had with Dr. Kathleen Hayhoe. So you can use the chat. You can use that chat uh, to introduce yourself, uh, to participate in our training. Ellie's gonna give some prompts in just a little bit. Uh, we're also gonna have breakout rooms. And so in those breakout rooms, you're gonna be in a smaller group with people. And during that time, if you have any questions, if you're having any issues, you can easily raise your hand in those rooms and Ellie or Salemi or myself or Tasha can jump in and help out. And we'll be able, if you click that raise your hand to address anything that you might be curious about, uh, you'll need a paper and pencil. So if you haven't grabbed one of those yet, feel free to uh, be low tech with us and have a chance to start taking some notes because we're gonna have some interactive activities to invite you to consider taking your climate advocacy to the next level today. So with that though, we're at the top of the hour and I am so honored to be on the line with our Director of Field Development, Ellie Sparks, and our wonderful CCL Southeast Regional Coordinator, Salemi Hernandez. Thank you all for joining us. We're looking forward to a great Earth Day webinar together and I'll pass it to you, Ellie. Mm, thank you, Brett, welcome. Riding in the backseat of a 66 Volkswagen Beetle, coming home from my grandmother's farm, my toe-headed little sister and I fought each other for space or snuggled up like kittens and fell asleep together. When we argued, Mama sang. She sang about mermaids and lighthouses and maidens fishing in cool shady nooks by the side of a brook. At Christmas, dad chimed in with Good King Wenceslas and mom sang the voice of his page. In those songs, our parents taught us about the beauty and gift of nature. We learned to serve others and value friendship. In the patriotic songs, they connected us with country and citizenship. This land is your land, this land is my land. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. And one of my favorites, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. That is the story of Washington. When I encountered Citizens Climate Lobby and the idea that we citizens would help our government solve climate change, well, it all clicked. I was only three years old on the first Earth Day in 1970, but my mother's singing during my childhood instilled a love for life and beauty and others, a commitment to help, and a sense of duty to ensure that our country move in the right direction on all things, including climate. Ellie. I think there might be other people also called by something deep inside of themselves to act in climate. Change. Let me tell us. Yes, the men and women of the House of Representatives co-sponsored the 2019 Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Florida Democrat Ted Deutsch sponsored the bill. Republican Francis Bruni joined him along with Democrats Judy Hsu, Charlie Priest, Anna Hsu, Dan Limpisky, and Scott Peters. Do you think their mother sang son to set them down in the back of their seat too? Maybe, something certainly inspires them. And how wonderful that they support HR 763. I like how it reduces emissions, helps people and strengthens the economy. The bill's current co-sponsors total 80 and counting. Mothers, mermaids, or George Washington, whatever stirs someone's soul, Congress now offers options for solving climate change. This slow moving chronic problem that increasingly reminds us of its urgency and crisis status. Ellie, we have climate heroes mounting in the Senate too. 14 senators, half Republicans and half Democrats, form the Senate Bipartisan Climate Solution Caucus. They seek possible, meaningful climate solutions policy. Well, we've introduced the Congressional Climate Heroes. Let's introduce our presentation team. Salemi, you go first. Sure, my name is Salemi Hernandez. I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator, which includes Alabama, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina. 
I have been a community grassroots activist for around seven years. Uh, being with CCL and seeing the transformation organization that it is, I decided to study political science. Uh, to learn to be more effective with the government. So I'm a part-time student now. And I'm also the mother of two kids, which my oldest son's birthday is today. He's 13 today and taller than me. <laughs> Happy to you, Ellie. <laughs> Happy birthday to your baby, Salemi. Thank you. So 10 years ago, I started the first chapter of CCL in Virginia. Five years later, I joined up as staff. I am the mother of two, they are young adults, and grandmother of one, little Isabel. And I farm regeneratively with my farm partner. We've got 80 acres in the Virginia countryside, southwest of Richmond. Brett, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you all for being on the line. It's so great to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Brett Cease. I'm out of Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, my background, I started one of the first chapters here in Minnesota in Bemidji back about 10 years ago. I've got a doctorate in public policy and political economy. I love really studying the policy implications of these impacts. And uh, my background before joining CCL was a high school social studies teacher and an outward bound canoe guide. So I still love getting out there and paddling and that's why I'm in it to preserve those places for the next generation. I also wanted to pass on this exciting news. Uh, Salemi and Ellie, we actually have almost 300 people already on the Zoom call. And I'm curious how you'd like to go about introducing all of them. Well, Brad, we're gonna use the chat. Find the chat button on your Zoom screen, click that button. Please chat where you live and what you are most committed to life in and why. All right. So let's jump right in. I'm going to have a chance to read a couple of these people. I know that uh, as people are typing, we've got a lot of opportunities to learn from each other today, too. We've got Jupiter, Florida represented. We've got a wonderful contingent out of Alaska and California. And feel free to also share what you're committed to as well. Portia shares that she's committed to a sustainable future as the mother of a four-year-old child. We've got a full contingent on Hawaii, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire. The question is, what are you most committed to and because of why? Share that in the chat as you're going through here as well. Uh, we've got some great representatives uh, in Georgia, New York, Tennessee, Ohio, Chicagoland, Washington. I'm most committed to fighting structural injustice, Catherine says, out of San Fran. Thank you for that. Cindy says, I'm committed to the climate crisis because we're running out of time. Geraldine shares she wants to ensure a sustainable environment for the future as a grandmother. There's so many stories out there. Keep them coming and share and learn from each other. And with that, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for introducing yourself. Ellie, can you tell us about our workshop today? Sure, so let me, but first, a story. In 2013, our Texas volunteers had recognized a roadblock. For three years, they faithfully secured meetings with congressional offices. Those cordial meetings lacked the progress our volunteers wanted. The, the engineers in the chapter noted that it felt as if they pulled against a stuck lever. Across the country and in Texas, CCL members also spoke to civic and faith leaders. They wrote letters to the editor. They met with editorial page editors to generate enthusiasm. What would happen, our Texas volunteers wondered, if they shifted their focus away from Congress and instead focused on influencers? Might Congress more easily act once they heard from local influencers. Our Texas volunteers sorted our activities into five categories they dubbed the five levers of political will. If one lever feels stuck, then activate the other levers. This workshop follows our Texas volunteers into the realm of the five levers. Along the way, we examine our values identify individual assets and collective strengths, and commit to our next steps. What will each of us do in the month of May to move Congress closer to climate solutions? 
So let's start with our values. At Citizens Climate Lobby, we focus on what we want. We want to solve the climate crisis. We want a livable planet. In this exercise, we get down on the ground exploring what you want to preserve. A quote by E.B. White helps to frame this exercise. Before I read the quote, please open your chat again and tell us who is E.B. White, if you know. Brett, can you tell us if anybody's getting the answer to who is E.B. White? No early entries. Here we go. Authors of Charlotte's <laughs> Web, Stuart Little. Uh, we've got a great uh, contingent of Cornell professors. Lots of great answers, Ellie. <laughs> awesome. Very good. So you all know. Um, so I love good storytelling, and I really enjoyed E.B. White's books as a child. Preferring math over English, I struggled to understand the elements of style, which many of you brought up. Had he written Guidelines on Algebra, I may have enjoyed that book. Now, in a 1969 New York Times interview, reporter Israel Schenker quoted White. If the world were merely seductive, that would be easy. If it were merely challenging, that would be no problem. But I arise in the morning, torn between a desire to improve or save the world and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. In CCL, we add, but if we forget to savor the world, what possible reason do we have for saving it? In a way, the savoring must come first. So let's savor. So let me please get us started. Let's consider what we love about life. Maybe family traditions or a special spot in nature. Perhaps music, art, poetry, a certain way of life. Let's record what we love about life on earth, describing it in great detail. Please have a pay and pen a paper handy. First, Ellie, would you share something very specific about what you love? Sure, thank you, Seleni. So I live in Virginia on a small farm southwest of Richmond. I love walking through the woods on my farm. I love encountering moss growing in the woods. This is a picture. It grows year round. Even in the cold, after the leaves have fallen off the trees and there is snow on the ground, I like bending down on my knees to look at it closely. I love how it seems like a little forest unto itself. I love the strange shapes and the dense mass and the varieties of green. I love how it feels on my hand, soft and velvety. I even love its aroma moist and minerally. What a lovely description, Ellie. I can imagine kneeling down next to you, our noses on the ground, looking at the magical world of Moses. Thank you. Let's follow Eddie Motter. Let's describe in great detail something specific we love about life on earth. Connect with your senses. What do you see? What can you smell? How does it feel in your hands and feet? Who shared that experience with you? When does it happen? How does it stirs your heart or inspires your mind? What does it taste like? Fred, can you start the two minute timer, please? You got it, here we go. All right, back to you guys, we're at the two minutes. Thank you, Fred. Now let's share with each other. Fred will put us in breakout rooms, soon allow for 50 breakout rooms. With so many people on the call and limited time, Let's have two people share in each breakout room. The youngest goes, the youngest and the older one will share what they love about life on earth. When you go into the breakout rooms, go around the room and quickly announce your name and age. You don't have, you can make up your age, we don't care. The youngest person jumps right in and share first. After one minute, the oldest person step up and share. If time allows, others can share too. A Zoom pop-up will message you asking you if you want to come back to the main room. 
Decline soon offer and enjoy those final 59 seconds. Soon will bring you back to the main room once the countdown stops. People on the phone, please press star six to mute and unmute yourself. I know this sounds complicated, but we trust you that you can figure it out. Brett, do you have to break our room ready? We do, yes. All right. Enjoy the sharing, everyone. Youngest goes first, oldest goes second. Older can share if time's allowed. Have fun. All right. So, all right, everyone's all back. I'll pass it back to you, Salemi and Nelly. Thank you, Brett. Welcome back. We went micro with that story, up close, maybe on the ground sniffing moss in a Virginia forest. Let's take back now, far back, as an astronaut see things. Nearly 20 years ago, our founder, Marshall Sanders, heard an inspired sermon at church about an astronaut called Rusty. 13 years ago, Marshall included a part of that sermon in our first climate advocacy training. Ellie, please read that to us. Here's the excerpt from the sermon. During his Apollo mission in 1969, astronaut Rusty Schweikert was let out of the capsule on an umbilical cord. Usually, NASA keeps the astronauts compulsively busy up there. But a peculiar thing happened to Schweikert. Just as he emerged from the capsule, something went wrong within the capsule. Both mission control in Houston and the remaining astronauts had to concentrate on the problem. This left Rusty all alone, floating around Mother Earth in complete cosmic silence. During this time, Rusty had two profound conversion experiences. He looked back on Mother Earth, quote, a shining gem against a totally black backdrop and realized everything he cherished was on that gem. His family and land, music and human history with its folly and its grandeur. He was so overcome that he wanted to quote, hug and kiss that gem like a mother does her firstborn child. Compassion flowed through him. Trained as a jet fighter pilot, he was a typical macho man, but a breakthrough of something bigger came washing over him at that moment in space. Rusty's second awakening in space was a political one. He was a red, white, and blue American who believed what he had always been taught, that the world was divided between the communist world and the free world. Yet, while floating around Mother Earth, he saw that rivers flowed indiscriminately between Russia and Europe, that ocean currents served communist, socialist, and capitalist nations alike, that clouds did not stop at borders to test for political ideology, and that there are no nations. Nations exist in the mind of the human race alone. On returning to NASA, Schweikert was not debriefed by any spiritual director about his mystical experiences. He confesses to having wandered about in a state of stupor for six months, bumping into walls while asking himself repeatedly this one question, why did God do this to me? Finally, he concluded that God did this through him so that others might hear the message. What message? Compassion, interdependence, shared beauty on this glistening, shining planet. The holy earth, we must take such care of it. <laughs> it must take such care of us. This side of heaven, we are each of us so nearly all the other has. There is darkness all around us, yet between us, there is just enough light to get by. All right, so let me, so how do we apply this to lobbying? 
Uh, first of all, Ellie, that was beautiful. Thank you for that. Our passion for life motivate our work on climate solutions. When we, meet, when we meet with members of Congress, one of our volunteers briefly shared their personal story. They described what, the most, what they are most committed to and why, and what they love about life and what, around, what they want around for future generations. Relationship goes two ways. So what we discover, so we want to discover what motivates others. Every person has something they savor about life, about the planet. Our members of Congress do. Editorial page editors do. Our neighbors do. We listen for little hints about the things they love. Ellie, tell us about how the volunteers built a relationship with the editorial board, with the editorial page editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch by following the trails of savory breadcrumbs. <laughs> Thank you, Salami. I love that story. So 10 years ago, shortly after starting the Richmond chapter, we met with the editorial page editors of the Richmond Times Dispatch, including Todd Culbertson, pictured here. In the meetings, we focused on our legislative proposal. Outside of the meetings, we became friends with him. He shared that he loved adventuresome foods. We learned how he valued his personal faith and spiritual journey. We read about his trips to South Africa, meditating at a monastery and volunteering in the community. We also discovered that we shared values with Mr. Colbertson. I love exotic foods. Monica is Episcopalian. Lots of us enjoy to travel and we all volunteer, just like he does. Several years in, our media team met again with the editorial board. Mr. Colbertson had tickets to South Africa the very next day. In advance, we printed two articles about climate change and climate heroes from South Africa. We brought those articles plus one article about climate change in the US. Of the three articles, Salemi, can you guess which two he selected for reading on the plane? The two about climate change and South Africa. Exactly. Our volunteers also baked extreme weather cupcakes for the meeting. Mr. Culbertson and his team enjoyed every one of those cupcakes too. And speaking of cupcakes, Ellie, we need a little break. When we're <laughs> faced with a threat, the humans, humans fight, flight, or freeze. With an existential threat like climate change or a pandemic, adrenaline runs through our body, but we don't release that adrenaline in fight, flight, or freeze. Let's get up our chair now and check out all that adrenaline. Brett, could you give us a minute of music, please? <laughs> I feel better too. All right, so let's circle back to the news that Congress has a bipartisan idea introduced as a bill with bipartisan support. In late 2018, the House and the Senate introduced the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act with Republican and Democratic sponsors. A great step forward the bill came too late in the session for any movement. The House reintroduced the Energy Innovation Act in the new Congress last January. Congress will take H.R. 763, 
through committee hearings, committee votes, and a floor vote. We will keep the drumbeat for this success going and growing. So let me, let's take a deeper look at the bill. Thank you, Ellie. First of all, this bill is effective. It would, it would drive down American emissions by 40% over 12 years. That's really good news. Salemi, are there any other bills as effective as the Energy Innovation Act? No, Ellie, this bill beats all of them reducing emissions. Yay, wonderful. Now, will HR 763 help us meet goals in the Paris Climate Agreement? HR 763 will help us to do our part in the U.S. to stay below two degrees Celsius global average temperature increase. But Salemi, scientists stay, say we must stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. How does the bill measure up to that goal? It brings us close. And once Congress passes the Energy Innovation Act, we, keep them, we, we help them to take more steps for sure. The Energy Innovation Act stands as the best first step for Congress to take in reducing carbon emissions from burning fossil fuel. That's right, Ellie. As a Hispanic woman, part of a minority group, I want to know how HR 763 will impact members in my community, especially the most vulnerable. Well, Salemi, so we've got good news on that front. The bill sends cash back to people every month. By year 10, a family of four gets $4,410 per year. Everybody gets cash back every month to spend it as, as they see fit. Is that right, Ellie? That's right, Salemi, yes. So when poor and middle-income people have extra money, they spend it on Main Street. Poor people buy more groceries. Middle-income folks eat more restaurant food. Both groups pay for health care they previously couldn't afford and middle-income people replace their cars more frequently as electric car prices drop. The fleet of vehicles in this country will move from gas to electric. When people spend the cash they get back from the Energy Innovation Act, job opportunities grow. HR 763 sends cash back to everyone. It doesn't matter where you live or how much money you earn. Everybody gets a monthly payment. The economy sounds good. I'm just concerned about environmental justice. Every year, 114,000 people die prematurely from pollution. In the US, 70% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal fire plant. Latino, indigenous communities, and low income communities are more likely to be disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. I completely understand that concern, Salemi, and we've got good news. The Energy Innovation Act reduces carbon pollution, decreasing the number of premature deaths. Ellie, how does the Energy Innovation Act work? The Energy Innovation Act uses a carbon fee and dividend approach, which works like a three-legged stool. First, the bill places a steadily rising price on carbon assessed upstream on the fossil fuel companies directly to keep the administrative costs low. The fee starts at $15 per ton of CO2 and increases by $10 per ton each year on top of inflation. Our second leg of the stool sees to it that 100% of the net revenue collected from the fee it's allocated equally to households. That's the cash back part of the bill. Our third leg of the stool puts a fee on goods coming from countries without a similar price on carbon. We call that the border carbon adjustment. Let's look at the regulatory cost. Some people feel alarmed when they hear the bill passes regulation. I worry too when I first heard about this. Will the past derail our efforts to solve the climate crisis? After investigating, I see the wisdom of the regulatory past. The bill authors identify a short list of current and future regulations that address greenhouse gases covered in the Energy Innovation Act. They temporarily stop those regulations, which prevent double jeopardy. 
Excuse me, please, Salemi. What about CAFE standards on cars and the Clean Air Act? CAFE standards and Clean Air Act continue going in full force. In. So which regulations fall under the pause? The Clean Power Plan, which is currently tied up in court. The Clean Power Plan, if it were enacted, reduce emissions by 3% by 2050. In contrast, the Energy Innovation Act reduced emissions by 90% during the same time. I am willing to pass the Clean Power Plan with its 3% reduction so we can get a 90% reduction from the Energy Innovation Act. We might need regulations if something unforeseen derails the Energy Innovation Act down the road. Good thinking, Ellie. The sponsors consider that too. So they include a tune-up starting in five years. At that point, if the bill falls short of its climate goals, the fee would automatically increase by $15 instead of 10 for that year. After 10 years, if we do not meet or exceed our climate goals, even with the higher rate of increase, the bill requires the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions so that we can meet our climate goals. I like how Democrats and Republicans found a balance between their often opposition positions on regulation. All right, so let's do a recap. The Energy Innovation Act aligns with our values. First and foremost, it works. It reduces America's emissions by 40% within 12 years, leaps and bounds beyond the effectiveness of any current greenhouse gas regulations, Economists and scientists find it simple, comprehensive, and effective. We also like the Energy Innovation Act because it is good for people. It improves health and save lives, reducing pollution that Americans breathe. People get cash back every month to spend as they see fit, helping low and middle income Americans. Most will spend that money on Main Street which creates job growth right here on American soil. We like this bill because it is good for the economy. These ideas emerged from bipartisan conversations out of, in and out of Congress. Both the 2018 and the 2019 versions include Democrat and Republican co-sponsors. Let's digest HR 763 with breakout rules. Imagine Zooming with your family, friends, or coworkers. Someone asks you, what did you do this weekend? You mentioned this workshop and the Energy Innovation Act. Then you describe one thing you like about the bill. You might say, I went to a virtual Earth Day workshop this weekend. I learned about a bill in Congress called the Energy Innovation Act. I really like the fact that the bill can fill up the blanks. Be sure, sweet, and to the point. If you cannot find something that you like, then hold on those concerns. Q&A Q &A come next. Simple say pass or skip. We have nine minutes in breakout rooms. This time go alphabetically by first name. Jump in, move steadily. Keep your shares short. The first person that shares also serves as a timekeeper. The shares are one minute length Timekeeper says gentle reminder with 10 seconds left on the clock, on the clock for each chair. Soon give us 59 seconds warning. Stay in your rooms to continue sharing. Brad, do you have those breakout rooms ready? I do, yeah. So just a reminder, you'll see a little prompt that says join breakout room. You'll click on that and then to unmute. It's just clicking on your little microphone icon or if you're not on your computer and phone only, it's star six. So we're going to open all the rooms up and we'll send a little reminder in another eight minutes that we'll rejoin. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everybody. And thank you for jumping in with Zoom. I know it's a challenge to learn new skills and we completely understand a piece of what happens in these workshops is you learn some new skills on Zoom. And this workshop, Breakout Rooms, is one of those skills that you are developing. So be patient with yourself. We are gonna do Q&A. Brett is going to look at the chat. We're gonna ask folks to type in their questions about the bill 
into the chat and we will do our best to answer those. And Brett, if you'll just start the timer for us as well. Oh, you've got it started. All right, so. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so Elliot, you want me to basically read some of these out here sure. and then have a chance to let both of uh, you and Salemi kind of respond to all of them? Is that kind of your thoughts? Yes, that sounds good. Okay, great. And are we only going to go off of uh, chat then? Yeah, let's do chat. Okay, great. So uh, here's a question that's come up a lot, and that is, especially for those that already might be economically impacted, how will they trust that the money they get back is actually going to help shield them from higher energy prices that will result of this policy? Okay, so great question. And again, like connecting with the concern about low income people there. So I think someone's unmuted, Brett, if you could track that down. So the, the design of the money going back to people is part of something called a Pigovian taxation. It's a, if I were studying economics, which I did and I studied fine arts in college, but had I studied economics, Pigovian taxation would be in that first economics 101 class. And the idea is that when people are harmed by something, a market exchange, then you need to help to make them whole if they weren't part of that exchange. It's, um, so the, the money going back to people is an attempt to make everyone a bit more financially whole for the financial losses they've suffered from the, the um, burning of greenhouse gases. That's the goal of that money going back to people. It just so happens that if you are poor or middle income, you have a small carbon footprint and even accounting for the cost of living increase that that fee is going to uh, have on all of us, your, the money you're getting from your dividend, if you're middle or income, middle income or, or poor, is going to be bigger than the money that you're, the cost of living increase. You can look up some of the studies on the CCL website, there are two. One is the dividend delivery study. Well, that's not the one I wanna to refer to you. There is, um, help me, Brett and Salemi, that where you type in your information and it looks at your cost of living increase versus- yeah, We have the household impact study, which is right. now kind of a calculator also that you can kind of check that out. So I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. So that you could look that up for your family or anybody you know, they can fill in the numbers there. And, um, but what we know is basically two thirds of households will come out better economically, even after accounting for the cost of living increase. And those are middle income and poor people. All right, give us another question, Brett. Yeah, this one comes up a lot here. So we're saying it's bipartisan, but there's only one house co-sponsor that's a conservative. What's going on there? Why are there so few? How can we get more? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it's a bipartisan idea. For certain, uh, there are economists on all sides of the aisle who support this bill. The U.S. Council of Mayors has an endorsement that they passed last uh, summer. The, so it is bipartisan in all of these ways. The original bill had more Republicans in it. And yeah, we need to get more Republicans on board. Uh, the Republicans are kind of like kids sitting on the side of the swimming pool. You know, you like, don't want to be the first one to jump in. It really helps if you can hold your friend's hand and you like all of you jump in at once. Woo! So that's what we're working on is getting a bunch of Republicans holding hands on the side of the swimming pool and jumping in at the same time. So if you're someone who has a Republican member of Congress, then you can be part of the effort to build political will in your community, members of Congress tell us it's most effective if they hear from local respected leaders, civic, faith, business leaders. And we'll be talking more about that in the second part of the workshop where we actually will be digging into those five levers. And if you are interested in um, that, those getting those kinds of endorsements to help your Republican member of Congress jump into the swimming pool, that would be a good thing for you to do with your time. Wonderful, Brett, next question. Yeah, these are great. Uh, there's another ongoing concern about, you know, if this is tied to our fossil fuel consumption level, uh, won't that mean eventually that the dividend itself goes away and isn't that a concern? That's exactly what we want. We want it that when you look at the graphs for the dividend, yes, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up because the amount of the fee is going up, even as the use of the fuel is going down. And then there becomes a point where it starts to drop off. And there is a, 
mechanism in the bill that uh, indicates what, how the bill phases out. When we get to 90% reduction, then we need to sustain that for a couple of years. And also the dividend at that point will have dropped and that drop needs to stay below a certain amount before we officially sort of close out the business of the bill. So yeah, that would be the design. And that my friend bringing that up is why we don't wanna do something like a tax swap. Let's say some people sometimes think in a bill like this, well, we should stop taxing people as much since we're getting this money. No, this money will eventually phase it out. That's the idea. We won't burn a, be burning fossil fuel. We won't be getting that fee money collected. So it's, I do not like it when people talk about doing like a tax swap, less income tax taken, less business tax taken because we got this money coming in. No, it's going to phase out. That would not be a smart plan. So good, good observation. All right, Brett, what else? Yeah, lots of great questions here. And I think uh, one of the ongoing kind of connections too that people are curious about is just uh, how they can be effective if they're already in an era that supports it. You know, they're saying, you know, I already have a Democratic co-sponsor as my member. How can I also reach out and be there for other people that are in need? Yes, very good. There's so many different things. Again, when we get into those levers, um, you can look at ways your member of Congress is going to need to stick with it. Your member of Congress can reach out across party lines. I remember visiting a Louisiana Republican member of Congress. I met in his office with our Louisiana volunteers in Baton Rouge. And he was so happy to tell us that he had a buddy member of Congress in California, a Democrat. And the two of those folks were working across party lines. So your Democratic members of Congress can reach out and become friends with Republicans and have these conversations in a, a, a friendly, across the aisle kind of way. So you can support your member of Congress in that. You might be somewhere where there is a, a business or, or a national organization. The Rotary Club, for example, cares about climate these days. It's one of their top issues. And so the more that Rotary Clubs take that on, the more that Rotary Clubs everywhere take that on. If your community is home to a national corporation or has outlets of that national corporation and you can influence that corporation, that corporation's voice may have sway for a Republican member of Congress in another part of the country. So there's plenty to do to activate these five levers. We are both um, districts, states, and a country in many ways. All right, Brett, what's next? Oops. Yeah, no worries here. And Salemi, do you have any other thoughts on, on that one or others yet? I know we've been kind of doing this rapid fire. Fine, thank you, Brett. All right, no worries. Um, so let's talk more, a little bit more about kind of this dynamic with putting a price on carbon and why some of the big oil corporations may be in support of it, while it also might have an impact on smaller oil plays or, you know, producers that obviously can't scale up as quickly. Um, is there a reason in your mind why the, you know, big oil and gas uh, majors like ExxonMobil, BP, Shell uh, support this policy and what we'd say to a small independent producer? Yeah, so the big oil companies are shifting the way they function. They see themselves more and more as energy companies, so they are developing their portfolios in wind and solar, wave, geothermal, and uh, they, so that's what they're doing. Also, the, I saw uh, somebody had joined in this uh, workshop from West Virginia. We've got a bunch of our West Virginia volunteers and coal country volunteers. This bill phases out coal in 10 years. And out goes coal in 10 years. In comes wind. Wind replaces coal for our electrical production. So this bill really does is effective with changing the way that we create electrical power in this country. Out goes coal, in comes wind. There will likely need to be other policies that continue to support the transition from a, a gas-based um, uh, fleet to an electric fleet. Now those small producers, you know, that's a good question. What else is happening on their land in Texas 
Wind is big in Texas. So the same land where we've got oil drilling is the same land where we can put up wind turbines. And one can do that if one has a large track of land or one can work collectively with other landholders and create a, a wind power system that leaps across, you know, land, different boundaries of land that people own. So it, this, is, this is exactly, you know, American ingenuity is a piece of this solution. And um, those are some of my thoughts on that. Great question. Did uh, Salemi or Brett, did you want to add anything? Well, yeah, I mean, um, the energy companies are very smart. So they're going to look for the more economical, the, what it makes sense economically. And renewables, they don't have to deal with those natural disasters that happen with fossil fuel. And they really want something that they can rely on. They want to they wanna plan for the future. And they know that the future is facing our fall in fossil fuel. Great, yeah, thanks so much. There's a great ambitious chat discussion going on. I'm trying to keep up with some of the stuff we don't have to. Ellie, I have added an additional several minutes too, so I think we've got about four minutes left if that's all right with you. And here are some of the ongoing themes outside of that. Uh, this is kind of a theme for several of the questions. How does a bill like a carbon fee and dividend policy interface with the strong momentum uh, that other climate um, policies like the Green New Deal has right now? How are those two complementary? Yeah, so Green New Deal is actually not a policy. This is, uh, Energy Innovation Act is a bill, it's a policy. The Green New Deal is sort of a broad idea, it's a statement, it's um, a call for action. Uh, the Green New Deal umbrella could include a price on carbon, could include the Energy Innovation Act. So it's, it's two different, like it's kind of like the basket and uh, is the Green New Deal and Energy Innovation Act is a big apple in that basket. So they're, you're, they're not the same thing. We encourage and celebrate the work that people do in the Green New Deal. We have good collaboration going on member to member. We've had folks from the Green New Deal efforts coming and speaking to our regional conferences people in Congress who have supported the Green New Deal have also joined on as co-sponsors of the Energy Innovation Act. Yeah, All right, Brett, what's oh, next? Go for, go, go for it, Salim, I heard you. Yeah, I wanted to add to that an analogy that I use a lot about that. Um, a, the Green New Deal is like when we say we're gonna go to the moon. We didn't know how we were gonna do it, but we were gonna do it. And the HR 763 is a vehicle to get to the moon. So pretty much a backbone and something that would support the great deal, the, the Green New Deal. Yep, and uh, Bill has put a text uh, to that House resolution again. So it's not a specific policy number; it's a uh, House resolution. But H Res 109 is in the text there. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Bill. And uh, so let's talk about this then. This is also very prominent in the chat here: worker transition, supporting people obviously that are already going to be impacted. Maybe they're in an industry that is going to experience impacts. You know, what are discussions happening in coal country? I know Ellie, you've been active with our action team on that front. How will this policy or any effective uh, carbon price really look out for those that might be left behind in our transition? Yeah, transition plan is, is a good question. I would invite you to join up on the coal country action team phone calls. We have those twice a month. The um, for second, is it what, first and third Wednesdays at 12 noon Eastern time? And you can find out more about that on our community website. Those folks would really like their members of Congress at the table talking about this bill. They would like their members of Congress to say, hey, include something about a just transition. And that voice has to come from members of Congress talking to other members of Congress when these bills are being written. So our volunteers in coal country are urging their members of Congress to get to the table on the climate solutions discussion and to bring up the issue of a just transition. So that's at the federal level. Of course, at the state level, states need to reckon with this. Many coal country states, West Virginia, Wyoming, count on tax revenue. Wyoming really seriously counts on their tax revenue from their fossil fuel um, extraction. So they need to reckon with that and localities and nonprofits all need to be looking at that. Please join us on the Coal Country Action Team. I'm 
a member of that. And I should also say we have a wonderful team uh, that is mainly composed of oil and gas uh, engineers or you know former you know people within that industry as well that are really working on that intersection. If you come uh, with a background and interest in those impact communities, we've got action teams across the board working on environmental justice, working on faith outreach, working on uh, outreach to conservatives, progressives, you name it. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the chat. Ellie, I know we're at the very end of our time and one of the other things we haven't gotten to yet, and I'm happy to keep responding in the chat to other things that we don't have time for here, is why hasn't this moved forward then? If this is such a great policy, what's the pushback? You know, what's the holdup? Where's the beef? Yeah, let's get into that with the second part of our workshop because we need to build political will, my friends, and that's what we're here to do. So let's explore that. We've talked about our values. We've talked about your values, our values. We've looked at the bill. Exactly, you're wondering how are we going to inspire Congress to lead? How do we get people to join us in the effort to help Congress find its way forward? How do we have those conversations? Sorry about that. All of those are great questions, Ellie. But before we respond, how, how about another movement break? <laughs> Definitely. Let's get up. Tell us. Well, our ancestors knew that as community, we need to move intense experience together. After a crisis or a devastation, people gather around the fire and dance. Men and women, old people and children, move in circle, move their bodies, remembering life, mourning losses, celebrating success, building excitement to do both things. They knew what our body tell us, move the trauma, move the celebration through, move the power through, move through movement. So let's all get up and get moving. to answer that question how all right so let's look at the story of gandhi and general smuts for guidance you may know how mahatma gandhi's efforts to end british rule of colonial india before that gandhi fought for the rights of indians in south africa and in that south african campaign he found himself toe to toe with the head of the Transvaal government, General Jan Smuts. They actually met several times. Now imagine Gandhi, a short man, five foot tall, wearing traditional Indian garb. In contrast, General Smuts stood towering above him, a tall man over six feet, dressed head to toe in full military regalia with medals of honor and rank adorning his chest and shoulders. When they met for the first time, Gandhi walked over, looked up, and quietly announced, I've come to tell you that I'm going to fight against your government. Looking down and laughing, Smuts replied, oh really, do you have anything else to tell me? Gandhi said, yes, I am going to prevail. Smuts snickered and said, how are you going to do that? Gandhi smiled and replied, with your help. Ultimately, Gandhi won the general's respect and friendship. In 1914, South Africa repealed the laws most offensive to the Indians and voted basic civil rights into law. Gandhi had courage and determination. He refused to take undue advantage of his adversaries, and he had an endless capacity to stick it out without yielding and without retaliation. 
We share those values and seek to foster those characteristics within ourselves that help us build relationships to solve problems. Salemi, you're muted again. All right. Relationships like this make up the heart of CCL methodology, Eddie. Six years ago, six years ago, people say Republicans will not sponsor a resolution in Congress that says that climate change is real, significantly influenced by humans, and that Congress should lead on solutions. We gave it a go anyway and worked with Representative Gibson as he introduced the Republican climate resolution. Four years ago, people said Republicans and Democrats in the House would not meet, form, or join a joint climate caucus. We tried anyways, working with Representatives Ted Deutsch and Carlos Cubello to create the Bipartisan Climate Solution Caucus on the House. In December 2018, the caucus grew to 90 members, 45 Republicans and 45 Democrats, meeting regularly to discuss solutions to climate change. People thought the Senate would never follow suit. A year ago, the Senate formed its bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, currently at 14 members, half Republicans and half Democrats. And people told us Republicans and Democrats would never co-sponsor and introduce significant climate legislation together because it hadn't happened in over a decade. We ignored the mayors working for 10 years with all the members of Congress. Today we have 80 members co-sponsoring the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. As our director says, we're burying the ranch on relations. I have a poem by John Fox who teaches poetry for healing, like music or art therapy. I love what he says about relationship. When someone deeply listens to you, it's like holding out a dented cup you have had since childhood and watch it filled up with cold and fresh water. When you balance on the top of the brim, you are understood. When it overflows and touches your skin, you're loved. When someone deeply listens to you, the room where you stay starts a new life, and the place where you wrote your first poem begins to glow in the minds of your eyes. It, it is as if gold has been discovered. When when someone, this, when someone deeply listens to you, your birth beats are on the earth, and a beloved land that seems distant is now home within you. Thank you, Salemi. That poem reminds me that when someone feels heard, they feel at home, at ease, and open, and that's the place where all things seem possible. People learning how to deeply listen use tools called reflective listening or values-based conversations or motivational interviewing. The basic sequence runs something like this. First, find the other person right. Second, reflect back and confirm what you think they said. Third, identify and confirm their values. Four, find common ground with those values. And five, ask permission to express your thoughts related to those shared values. Before we move into the details on value based on listening, let's consider what it looks like when someone doesn't feel heard. When I think someone isn't hearing me, then I might repeat myself over and over, hoping my sinking. Sometimes I catch myself getting louder and louder as if shadow will help you hear me. Or I get quiet or say, and say nothing. After all, what should I try if you really don't want to hear me? Am I turning to my cell phone or walk away? If we want to have our turn to talk to someone ready to listen to us, we can start by deeply listening to them first. So let's try taking ourselves through deeply listening stint that we might hear when talking about the Energy Innovation Act. Oh, are you there, Brett? You're muted. Okay. Yeah, do you want me to read that question for you? Yeah, if you would. 
Yeah, great. So uh, one thought I guess I have that comes to mind is just what about underserved communities? And we talked a little bit about uh, that in Q&A, um, but I think a key question or concern might be, you know, won't they be in negatively impacted when they're already suffering from the coronavirus outbreak? Awesome. Thank you, Brett. Okay, so we're going to do a chat exercise again. So open up your chat. On the chat, let's share some ideas about how to respond. First, we want to find them right. We want to tell them that we appreciate the question in some way. So you, what is the first thing you might say to people? And Brett, if you'll read some of those as they come up in the chat, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. And again, someone, would you mind uh, just kind of prompting yeah. everyone again? So someone has just said to you, what about underserved communities? Are, they're already suffering from COVID. Oh, look, here's some. There, that's a wonderful question. You raise an interesting point. I'm so happy we both care about this. Oh, good. These are great. Any, anyone else want to add some? Let's see. I'm glad you gave me a chance to think about this. You are right. I care about that too. How can we make it better for them? I had the same question. Things are so tough right now. Oh, these are beautiful. Lovely, lovely, lovely. All right, good. So I think we got that. We're getting those. Feel free to, oh, I'm sorry for the troubles you're facing in these times. Yes, it could be personal. I love your heart for the vulnerable. Wonderful. All right, so we have found them right. Now we're going to, which some of you have already kind of done this, reflect back and confirm what we think we heard them say. So they asked about underserved communities already suffering from COVID and they expressed worry that the Energy Innovation Act would harm those communities already suffering. So notice we're not yet answering the question. We're first confirming what we think we heard them say. So use your own words in the chat. Tell them what you think you heard them say and you can sort of can ask to confirm or correct. Sometimes I like to say, if I'm hearing you correctly, or correct me if I'm wrong, I think I heard you say, or something like it sounds to me like you've said this, have I got that right? So let's do a little reflecting back. This is the reflecting part. Oh, I'm hearing you are worried about this vulnerable group. You're worried that they may act, the act may harm people instead of help. It's wonderful that you wanna make sure that vulnerable people are not negatively impacted. We are, it sounds to me like you're concerned about underprivileged. Okay, these are great, really nice work. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're concerned about harming vulnerable people. I think I heard you say that, we, that you are worried the act might harm the weakest. So beautiful job in using different words, your own words, so that the person can hear that you understand what they're saying. Nice job, all right. So Salemi, over to you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you everyone for playing with us. Using the chat, this time name, a, name the value you identified and confirm that with them. Remember, remember, here's what they said. What about underserved communities? Won't they be negatively impacted and they're already suffering from the outbreak of COVID-19? You might say, I am hearing you express your commitment to economic justice. Is that right? Let's see some ideas on the chat. All right, so people are saying uh, we're concerned about the economy, right? I hear that you care for the underserved. Am I understanding you correctly that this is an important issue to you? If I'm hearing you correctly, you're worried not about how the bill um, will impact people. Uh, sorry, you're worried about how the bill will impact people who are not well off financially. And this is a great one too. You have a strong sense of concern for the community, including the most vulnerable. So now we have identified their values and confirmed those. In our next step, we'll find common ground. Tell them what you share or respect. Tell, tell them that you share or respect their values. You could say something like, I also care about economic justice. It's chat time again. Type your sentence based on the value that you identify with. All right, it could be as simple as I totally agree with you to something a bit more nuanced, like I share your concern with the burdens that the most vulnerable members of our community face. You know, being explicit, I share your concern. These are great examples, keep them coming. I also care about my neighbors who are suffering 
You've identified a key concern that we need to explore. I really like that one. Uh, many people, including me, share your concern about vulnerable people. Christians, we should all care about the vulnerable. I'm passionate about this issue. In fact, I wasn't particularly concerned about environmental issues for a long time. I thought that poverty and homelessness were more pressing issues. I come from a lower class background. I really appreciate your empathy. These are really great, great build outs. Thank you so much for sharing on kind of how to build out that common ground. Nice. So, so let me, I love this last part of the sequence. May I jump in here to describe the last step? Sure, Andy. Awesome. So in our final step, we ask permission before we share our own thinking or our own knowledge. So we're building again on those previous steps. I also value economic justice. I was pleased to discover that the co-sponsors actually address that issue with the mechanics of the Energy Innovation Act. May I share how the bill creates economic justice? So this one, we have a question at the end. May I share how the bill creates economic justice? Would you like to hear? Let's go back to the chat. So we're gonna say we're building on that. We share those common values and we, we learned something about the act and would they like to hear? May we share? Oh, good. All right. So we got, would you be willing to hear how this affects the homeless? I understand what, what would you like see, to see done? It sounds like we do have the concern in common. Have you any suggestions? So those are good. What I want to sort of adjust you on a little bit is you've got some information because you know the bill a bit. And before you tell them, we've got that dividend that goes to households, middle income and poor people wind up with more money in their pocketbooks. Before you say that to them, you want to ask if they're ready to hear some information from you. So at this point, we're not pulling any more out from them. We've got something valuable. We think that they might like to hear about. We're just asking first, would you like to hear what I've learned about that? Would you like to know how? Yes, exactly. Good. There, we're making that shift. Are you open to hearing one idea about how this could actually benefit the economically vulnerable? Good. I like that. Would, are you open to hearing? Can I tell you how the bill can help the vulnerable members of our community? Share, sounds like we share the same concerns. I've learned some things about HR 763, about how this can help. Beautiful. All right, lovely. Oop, more, more, more. Sounds like you've given this a lot of thought. Oh, lovely. Would you be interested in hearing some of the solutions CCL has also considered? Very nice. All right, very good. Well, I just have to say you guys are such good sports to be working with us through the chat. Yeah, really, really great. appreciate that. Yeah. All right. So when I think of Gandhi and General Smuts, I imagine that General Smuts had a certain way he thought things should go as a general. Not only did they differ in size, but Smuts also had the entire South African government and armed forces at his disposal. Gandhi was not going to win with physical power. Gandhi needed to appeal to something deep inside of Smuts. Gandhi needed Smuts on his team, looking together at the problem, seeking solutions together. Now, I imagine Gandhi utilizing the deep listening techniques with Smuts, allowing them to work together. Smuts would tell you that Gandhi's approach worked. Just before Gandhi left South Africa, he sent a pair of handmade sandals to General Smuts. Gandhi had made those sandals himself. Smuts wore those sandals every summer at his farm and then returned the sandals to Gandhi on Gandhi's 70th birthday, saying, I have worn these sandals for many a summer even though I may feel that I am not worthy to stand in the shoes of so great a man. It was my fate to be the antagonist of a man for whom even then I had the highest respect. Now, Gandhi wasn't alone in his efforts and neither are we. 
When we know what assets and strengths we each bring to the table, we can organize efficiently and pleasantly. So for example, if you ask me to manage a database, I will, but I find it tedious and torturous. On the other hand, if you ask me to present a workshop, I will happily do so, especially if I have a team like Salemi and Brett with me. Uh, so best to send me to the Rotary Club on Zoom and find me a partner who can track in a database to which club I'm speaking next and what connections we made at the previous talks. So let's consider what you like to do and not do. On our next two slides, we have writing prompts for a volunteer inventory. These prompts help you to inventory yourself. You can answer in phrases or complete sentences. We will take five minutes with the first slide and one minute for the second slide. Hang on to your answers. They will come in handy after the workshop. So slide one, on your paper, write the questions and your answers. Here's how I would answer these. What would you like to share regarding your interest in CCL and climate change? Climate change is my number one issue of concern. I love the core values of CCL. I feel alignment and being effective in CCL. Number two, what are your interests? My interests, healthy eating, regenerative farming, my family, my grandbaby, art, music, and poetry. What are your areas of expertise? Presenting, regenerative farming, carbon farming, visual arts. Number four, in what other groups do you hold memberships? The Virginia Association of Biological Farmers, the Weston A. Price Foundation. Where do you live? Keysville, way out in the Virginia countryside. Six, how do you prefer to work? Solo, on creative projects, and in a team for presenting. So Brett, if you'll give us five minutes on the timer, and everyone, if you will take your piece of paper, uh, and write the questions and your answers, and we'll give you five minutes. All right, we have reached our time. I love the little crickets in that. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to Salemi for the next slide. Thank you, Ellie. Consider the items on this list. What do you like to do? What could you offer to do? Let's take a minute on this. You could, you could like chatting with strangers or familiar folks, maybe public speaking, doing presentations or town hall questions, writing letters to the editors, letters to Congress, social media posts, event planning, hosting the events, designing flyers for social media too, organizing information, volunteers, data entry, maybe research in your field, online related topics, outreach, calling, emailing, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Maybe you like technology, you want to help with Zoom, projectors. Maybe you like teaching and you want to share your skills and knowledge. Or you like networking within the chapter or external. So please keep your answers for after the workshop when you can contact your group leader to talk about these actions. Fred, let me know when the minute is up. I think we're good, Salemi, you, as you are reading those. All right, so let's circle back to the five levers of political will. Those organizing principles that our Texas volunteer developed in 2013. We will walk through each lever, describe the goal for each lever and, illust and illustrate how they interfere. All right, so at the top of the chart sits lobbying. We lobby Congress. We want members of Congress to lead on climate solutions. We want to show them that many people in the state or district want them to lead on climate solutions. Specifically, we want them to sponsor the Energy Innovation Act. The media team provides letters to the editor, op-eds, and editorial page endorsements of the bill. Grass Tops Engagement Committee secures endorsements in person or in writing of the bill from the local respected influential leaders. Grassroots helps lots of people call, email, snail mail, the members of Congress in support of the bill. And group development folks help hold the whole group together and move new volunteers into action and or positions of leadership. We organize ourselves and our activities around these five levers to divide and accomplish, which brings us to the question of which one of these levers is most attractive to you. 
As we look more deeply at the activities, listen to your inner guidance. Notice which lever most appeals to you and which activities related to that lever attracts you. It's perfectly fine if you like them all or can't really connect with any. If that's the case, simply ask your group leader how you can best assist them. Please take notes as we go and we'll give you some more details on those levers. Next, we have the lobby team. The lobby team in a chapter, there's five to four to five volunteers aim to meet regularly with the members of Congress and or their staff. These days, lobby teams use video chat for these meetings. In between meetings, there's a special volunteer called a CCL liaison who checks frequently with that congressional office. The activities in the other levels provide the deliverables to, them, to, demonst to demonstrate the interest, concern, and desire from the district or the state. The media team coordinates work with local media, newspapers, TV, radio, and social media. They write letters to the editor. Many letter writers graduate to op-eds. CCL volunteers secure editorial page endorsements. When a newspaper that endorsed a member of Congress also endorses the bill, it sends a powerful message to that member of Congress We've got your back if you support this bill, says the newspaper. Volunteers might create a PSA for local radio stations or work with Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Next, we got the grassroots. Prior to the pandemic, our volunteers secured handwriting letters for constituents seeking leadership from our members of Congress. We will hand deliver those letters during a face-to-face -face meeting. For the time being, now we're focused on phone calls and emails. Volunteers and friends sign up to call their members of Congress on a monthly basis, or they send a or and they send a personalized email via our website. Right now, Congress is focused on COVID-19. We want to thank them for coming together across party lines to solve big problems like the pandemic. Then we want to express our concerns for climate change and ask them to support the Energy Innovation Act. Chapters also have presentation teams. They also have presentations team dedicated to give talks about the Energy Innovation Act. Some of our outreach volunteers line up presentations, other volunteers give talks. Many civic and faith groups have relocated to Zoom. Good thing our members have familiarity with Zoom. Mm -hmm. Members of Congress consistently say that they need to hear from local leaders in the community. So volunteers build relationships and then seek endorsements from local leaders. We may focus on a specific industry. For example, brewers who really care about the right temperature for growing hops. A long list of endorsing breweries show up on the bill website. To endorse the bill, local leaders fill out an online form on the bill website. A group of CCLers took their local brewmaster to a meeting with the member of Congress. The brewmaster described the importance of a stable climate for growing hops for making beer. Thinking about hops and beer and climate change, the member of Congress found a renewed passion for solving the climate crisis. Now, each chapter needs a team holding the whole kit and caboodle together. The group development team supports the group leader in hosting the monthly meetings, these days, many chapters need someone doing tech support on Zoom, like Brett is helping us today. Every month, a round of phone calls to chapter members helps remind people of their monthly action commitments and dismantles any roadblocks stopping folks from following through. This crew also welcomes and orients new volunteers and organizes social gatherings on Zoom, if not in person. Our director, Mark Reynolds, says we're betting the ranch on relationships, and that includes relationships we have with each other in our chapters. Now, 
we're going to go around the room in breakout rooms again and looking at the five levers this time the person whose last name is last alphabetically goes first and is the timekeeper you can share your name your city and state which lever you like and what you want to activate with this lever during the month of may maybe you want to learn more about the lever Maybe you want to take a specific action or run a project or offer to lead a committee. Now, here's what I would say. I'm Ellie. I live in Keysville, Virginia. I like group development. I want to help my chapter start a formal process for onboarding new volunteers. I'm going to find the volunteer inventory on the CCL community website and show it to my group leader. Now remember, timekeeper can say gentle time. We seem to have nice small groups in the breakout room, so we trust you all to sort that out. Just move along through the group, letting everyone have a chance to share. Chat, uh, Brett's going to include the instructions in the chat. We'll have eight minutes, so sort of divide that up with the number of people in your room. Brett, send us to the breakout rooms. All right, they're all over. All right, the floor is yours. We're all back. All right, thank you, Brett. Welcome everybody back. I hope you each had a chance to share. Don't worry if you didn't, because we want you to share this with your group leader. We invite you to contact your group leader, ideally by phone. Ask them for 20 minutes of their time. Offer them with offer to share with them some of the thinkings based on this workshop today. Review your answers to the volunteer inventory questionnaire. Uh, talk about the five levers and where do you see yourself fitting in. Share your thoughts and what you like to learn, study, the action or project you want to tackle or start in May. Ask them if this will be helpful, helpful to the chapter and to them as a group leader. If you don't know who your group leader is or which group do you belong to, visit our website, citizensclimatelobby.org. Click in about, click chapters, look at the drop down menu and look for the chapter closest to you. Each chapter has a forwarding email. And if you, if after you email that chapter, you don't hear back from there, then please contact us at membership at citizensclimatelobby.org. Let's digest this workshop for a minute. Think about what touched us, what spoke, to, what spoke to us, what made us look at something in a new way. What did you hear with fresh ear? Share your take home nuggets and what would be rattling around your mind for a while. Use the chat to share. I see great workshop, thanks. Being a good listener, thanks for including me in your workshop. Thank you, Brett, Ellie and Salemi. A wonderful way to spend this time and very enlightening. Keep up the faith. The levers were interesting. Different way to engage. Very organized, good use of great intro. Liked the five levers. We love Catherine Hayhoe, I agree. Working together, feeling energized, feeling hopeful. Thank you for putting on this workshop. Learning there were others who were anxious and don't feel alone. Amen to that, I 100% agree. More on the levers, time well spent. The power of influencers. Nice leadership team, thank you. Yes, we love Hey Ho, yes, yes, yes. Learning about the bill, that's wonderful. Putting this as a priority, uh, beautiful, awesome. All right, those are beautiful. Feel free to keep putting them in. I'm going to share one thing to wrap us up. Um, so keep sharing those nuggets as you like. Let's close with a quote from After the Fall, Arthur Miller. For one of the finest American plays of the 20th century, Death of a Salesman, Miller married Marilyn Monroe. She adored him and loved being married, but she also struggled with drug addiction that ultimately ended both their marriage after five years and her life less than a year after their divorce. Now, after she died, he wrote a play called After the Fall. Many consider it autobiographical. 
in which he attempts to make sense of what happened in their marriage and with her suicide. The play is non-conventional, non-linear, and somewhat surrealistic. Our director, Mark Reynolds, read this quote to us on a group leader call nearly nine years ago. It spoke to me then, and it speaks to me today. Here it is. I think it's a mistake to ever look for hope outside oneself. One day the house smells of fresh bread, the next of smoke and blood. One day you faint because the gardener cuts his finger off. Within a week, you're climbing over corpses of children bombed in a subway. What hope can there be if that is so? I tried to die near the end of the war. The same dream returned and grew quite ill. I dreamt I had a child, and even in the dream, I saw it was my life, and it was an idiot, and I ran away. But it always crept into my lap again, clutched at my clothes, until I thought, if I could kiss it, whatever in it was my own, perhaps I could sleep. And I bent to its broken face, and it was horrible, but I kissed it. I think one must finally take one's life in one's arms. So, Thank you for taking your own life into your own arms, and we look forward to working with all of you as we cradle our democracy on our laps. We have that last slide. You can follow up with us by email with any questions. We have a survey we'd like you to fill out. And thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. We're right at the very end. And so if you have any questions, I put our emails in the chat as well. We're so honored to do this work together and know that we will create the political will for a livable world. As people are sharing in the chat, we're unstoppable and we're motivated and we're gonna get this across the finish line. So happy Earth Day, everyone. So glad to see you all. And we'll be ending the meeting now, but feel free to be in touch. So good to see you. Bye-bye. Together, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Brett. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.